Good morning. My name is Stephen Gallagher, as some of you probably know. And today I'm going to be talking about how do we reset Fedora to factory defaults, dealing with gremlins in the packaging guidelines. So I'd like to tell this as a, a bit of a story, uh, a, a play in three acts. Act one, the rise of the, of the RPM package manager. So once upon a time, a group of brilliant, uh, brilliant designers and engineers, innovators, developed a, a, a tool called RPM. They built this as a, a, as a system to create, uh, to do both building and delivery of software onto a system. And it, it, it it was a very ambitious project. It did a, it did a lot of things, and really, uh, it was that hammer right there. It is a, uh, and of course, when you have a hammer, how, how does that expression go again? Have a hammer. Oh yeah, everything looks like a nail. So over the, so as we progressed, RPM grew a lot of additional features. It became more and more complicated, and like I said, it pretty much ended up like that hammer. So once, we, once the RPM uh, was developed, we, we started to build uh, Red Hat Linux and then later Fedora using RPMs. It made, it made sense. It did a lot of cool things. It had, the, it had uh, the ability to put just about anything on the system that you wanted. It had the ability to configure it once you had finished installing it. We'll get back to that. And generally, uh, it, it did a lot that other packaging formats of the, of the era really couldn't do. And as it grew, uh, and as uh, we built Red Hat Linux and Fedora Linux, things started to get more complicated. We started to ha add a few more packages. We, had to, we started to build an entire, uh, really build an entire distribution around this thing. A lot of people were getting involved. They were excited. And suddenly we had, a whole, we had divergence starting to happen. Like, because RPM is so powerful and can do things in so many, uh, many different ways, people were doing things in many different wa ways. So we had to solve that problem. So we built the Fedora Packaging Committee, and we set up a series of guidelines for how, for how you can do things. One could even say rules. We can't expect everyone to do exactly the same good job, so let's, take, let's examine the set of packages we've got, figure out which ones are doing things the right way, and make them into a, a set of guidelines, and then publish those, and then so people can ignore them and continue to do things their own way. Wait, no. Uh, so that we have uh, we have a series of checks on these things. So when new packages come in, we verify that they are that they have been written in, in uh, you know according to these guidelines. And it was good. For many many years, Fedora has actually uh, actually built and released. This is this is a thing that happened, uh, contrary to all realistic expectation. Uh, we have actually built something that is good and that people like. We should. We want to maintain this level of excellence. So what happened next? Next, we started running into a few of the, of the places where RPM was not particularly designed for. For one part, exponential expansion of the number of RPMs in, in Fedora. In Fedora, we, we have grown by leaps and bounds. As of this morning, there are 19,470 packages in the Fedora project. I'm going to repeat that number because it threw me back a little bit. S source. There are 19,470 source packages in the Fedora project today. Yeah, binaries, I'm not even bothering to count, uh, especially since half of them are tech live. And more of them are being reviewed every day. Uh, on average, for the last uh, four Fedora releases, we have added 500 new packages to the project. That's 500 new packages in the last two years. And, amazingly enough, thanks to all those guidelines we built, most of them are high quality. The ones that aren't, a lot of the, a lot of the time, are ones that have just essentially bit rotted since they were reviewed, and there's there have been other talks and other, uh, uh, other proposals on how to deal with that bit rot. But for the most part, we've done pretty well considering the fact that 
this, this, this curve has just continued to grow at a faster rate every year. It's kind of ridiculous. But it's still mostly working, so that's not terrible. But then, then the next big thing happened. Oh, wait. Now we have virtualization. And while we were adapting to virtualization, containers arrived. Because we still hadn't, we really hadn't completed that, uh, that, uh, that pivot into virtualization in Fedora. We were a little behind the, cur the curve on that. We, had, we hadn't really figured out entirely how to, how to play in that space. But the, the, the real big change there was that now we are thinking entirely of an operating system running on a, piece of, a single piece of bare iron. We're talking about uh, density in data centers. We're talking about instead of the history where you would have a couple of really beefy machines that you would care for and feed and make sure they were, you know, make sure they had everything they, uh, they wanted. Uh, now all of a sudden you've got virtualization and you've got 300 disposable machines that are all doing the same task that if one of them is not, isn't malfunctioning, you yank it out of the rack uh, effectively, or the virtual rack, and you just, and you uh, throw up another one. And containers increases this even further, because you may have uh, you may have dozens of containers running on any uh, on any given virtual host. Now we have a, an entirely different problem. We have machines that we want to deploy fast. We have machines that we don't really need to care so much about their life cycle because they're disposable. You want, some, you want to change their life cycle, you, put, you, you pull up another one and you shut this one down. And what we really need to do there is we need to focus on figuring out, okay, so how do we make reusable images? How do we create these virtual machines and these containers in such a way that uh, we can rapidly throw 100 of them out there all at once? And the way people would do this with virtual machines is, you know, they'd stand up a VM on a, on a desktop in VMware or KVM or VirtualBox or what have you, and one person would go through and they would install absolutely everything they needed. They'd, they'd, run, it, they'd run their, their tests, effectively a, a private QA environment or a staging environment. Then they would manually, or later we, had, we added some tools to do this, go through and rip out anything that, that was necessary, that was specific to that machine. Things like uh, the host ID, things like, uh, uh, you know, various places that had UUIDs, various places that uh, had created SSL certificates by, uh, automatically to, to talk to between services. And the, they would have to go and rip these out, keeping notes on everything they did, write scripts so that when they deployed the new machine, they could put the, all those things back in. So we, what we were basically doing is passing on all of that effort to the users. We were giving them a whole operating system, but they didn't want a whole operating system. They wanted a template for an operating system. And pushing those, uh, pushing those things onto the user wasn't a particularly friendly thing to do. And we, uh, one, of the, one of the examples I, I like to use a lot, mostly because it comes up at least, I think, uh, with, when Will did his research, it came up at least 16 times in the uh, set of packages in RHEL, and I can only imagine how many packages it shows up in Fedora, was the creation of SSL certificates on, uh, during, in an RPM spec file. Let me repeat that. People are creating self-signed certificates in RPM percent post. That's not good <laughs> uh, for a variety of, me of, of reasons. And for one, it's if you're generating, if you're trying to generate a gold image uh, for something like OS tree or create a Q, uh, just push out a QCow for uh, for a cloud image and things like that, you're generating the RPM. You're installing the RPM once on a provisioning compose machine, and then its results just get put out, to, pushed out to every machine. And now suddenly you've got 5,000 machines in a public cloud somewhere that all have the exact same SSL certificate that match, that doesn't match their host name. That's not going to work. Furthermore, it's additional effort, as uh, if any of you went to Will's talk uh, two days ago, it's a whole bunch of uh, additional file operations and, and uh, f-syncs and things in the process that just simply don't need to be there and slow everything down. So how do we deal with the problem? How do we make those things go away? 
first, we have to, we have to eradicate Every, the scripts in RPM percent post we have, and, and percent post on and, ever, and wherever. And frankly, uh, if I would, if I can be so bold, I think we actually should uh, re release an, a version of RPM that doesn't that stops parsing scriptlets. We take that out of the system entirely. What we can do now that we have System D, we have uh, we have the ability to create new System D service units and mark them as required in order to start some uh, start other known services. So I'll take the Apache example or the cockpit example where they need to generate an SSL certificate. Instead of generating an SSL certificate in their percent post, and th those are bad examples because both of those have been fixed, but uh, instead of generating an, RP uh, an SSL certificate when you install the package, we instead drop a, a systemd snippet into, uh, into, uh, into the system so that when the HTTP service is activated, or either by, by uh, socket activation or service activation. It first invo invokes a, a, a systemd unit file that will check to see, hey, do those files already exist? If they do, eh, I, pass, I, I succeed and you get on with your life. If they do not, you go through a script and generate them for the first time. This means that we can push off the creation of any of those things that are happening in, in RPM scriptlets to either the first boot or the first boot after you wipe all the, after you run vert sysprep. We just, we pull, we remove those things from the disk and we do a, a systemd unit file that does condition path exists not u, uh, u, user, uh, or Etsy, Etsy my, uh, my, my service SSL.cert. Uh, so then we gener so we can generate those at first boot or on, on subsequent restarts of the service if you have, have any reason need to, uh, to do that. And they're out of the compose process. They're in a, they're in a space in the installed system where they, can, where they can be constrained by something like SE Linux. So we can, uh, so we can do a lot more protection of, of, of the end user system. Because one of the things that uh, a lot of cu uh, customers and users of Fedora and RHEL are concerned about with RPM scriptlets is they basically, especially when they're running on Anaconda, they have no restrictions. They, they operate as root, and you have to trust that somebody has been keeping an eye on what has gone into those scriptlets. If, you, uh, if we move those into the system with, with SE Linux protections, we can ensure that, no, that even if somebody managed, managed to slip a little something extra into that, into that SE Linux is probably gonna step in and say, eh, no, no, you're, uh, you know, your, your video game does not have permission, uh, have permission to read and write the, uh, to the Apache uh, directory and things like that. So we get, a, we get more security out of this. We avoid, uh, we avoid uh, issues with, in, with container and, and VM generation and generally, uh, and generally just improve the situation all around. So what we need to do next is analyze all of the packages in Fedora and find out which ones need to be adapted to use this new approach. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Will has done a really good job of uh, doing, going through this on RHEL. Uh, I would like to believe that he is also planning to do this on Fedora, but if he's not, I would like to get his scripts and get to work on it as well. Uh, yes, we should absolutely team up, Will. Thank you. Uh, Will, Will would very much prefer to team up because as he phrases it, his liver would not survive it and I can see how that could be a case. Um, we do expect in the next few weeks to a couple of months uh, to have a pretty clear picture of what the affected packages are, uh, will be and I will probably go through the Fedora mass uh, bug filing process, ideally with submitting, patch, uh, submitting patches. So that should, uh, that should allow us to fix those fairly easily. So, in summary, Keep your RPMs out of the light. Do not get your RPMs wet. Do not feed your RPMs after midnight. I, I cannot, uh, uh, please, stop working, stop working on RPMs when you're tired. Uh, that, one, that one is not only partially a joke. Stop working on RPMs when you're tired. That is how bit rot starts. Uh, I cannot, uh, I, I was, I, uh, as a bit of an anecdote, I was going through some package uh, the other day because it, uh, th that I was working with. And there were actually code, there were actually comments, rather, in the spec file that I, 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 I had to go back and get history to find out why it was there because it, it just said, 
I removed this uh, this section because I realized I had, uh, I realized that when I had written it, I was too drunk and too tired to have made any sense out of it. That comment remained, but not the context. And that was, uh, yeah. Um, and when I did go back and look at it, yes, this person was definitely too drunk or, or, and too tired to have written that. But uh, in all seriousness, um, the package guidelines have been written and updated to support this. Uh, if you have any packages that work that uh, have an, that do any kind of system specific initialization in, uh, in, a, in a scriptlet, please review the uh, review the document here, which describes exactly how to write that service unit that I was just, I was talking about uh, in many cases uh, exhaustive detail. So uh, it really should be an easy task, and if you can get to that before we get to you, uh, we get to you, uh, I will have a gold star for you. I don't have any right now, and I don't actually expect to give any of them out. But if I, but I will go and buy them, and and mail one to you, if uh, if you beat us to this. Uh, I rattled through that a bit faster than I had intended, so I've got a full ten minutes for questions. Sully. Okay, so, so the question is, is there an impact on startup time to have these new units and whether or not uh, are they removed after they are fired or, or not? So first of all, no, they will not be removed after they fire because the whole point is that we, need, we do need to be able to tolerate removal of, uh, of, the, of the files that, affect, that are affected because we may be in the process of generating an image, wipe them, copy the image around, and then we want to make sure they continue to run. The startup impact uh, when using the, uh, the systemd conditionals is it has not been measured at scale, but uh, on a few packages uh, it has been measured in the uh, nanoseconds of, of additional time, not, the, not even the microseconds, yeah, because the uh, systemd's conditional checks are pretty efficient. Uh, and if that became an, if it, it, honestly, that would be the optimization point if we needed to. It wouldn't. Be, it would be uh, more valuable than removing the units. So, further questions, Mike. I'm sorry. Uh, Okay. Okay. So the question is, uh, should, do we have to tell people while they're creating the gold masters not to create, not to start these services uh, before they create the master? And the answer is no. Uh, they can and should, because they're going to need to test that things work. What we have is, uh, we we have tools like Vert Sysprep, whose job it is to go to know which things are potentially uh, uh, potentially system specific and to wipe them before uh, as, uh, so you would do vert sysprep, shut the machine down clone the uh, image um, we need to, we need to make sure that we coordinate with the vert sysprep people and if there's if there are other tools like that out there um, I, I mean that's the best supported but if there are other tools out there, out there like that we need to have documentation that says here are the list of known things that we want to be able to remove I had a conversation with will uh, yesterday where we may want to have that. Uh, we, we may want to find a way to make language in the uh, in the RPM metadata that allows us to uh, interrogate that rather than have to maintain a separate list. Um, and th and that's uh, that's an opportunity for an enhancement here. Uh, right now, uh, Virtus Prep is pretty good. It knows an awful lot of these things, including a whole bunch that aren't even uh, that, that are in proprietary third-party uh, code out there you know, common, uh, common uh, customer applications and things like that. So we're in pretty good shape for that right now. And we, until we have that kind of introspection data, we'd probably ma keep maintaining the, uh, the whitelist and have to volunteer, uh, volunteer it as part of this process. Does, does that answer your questions? Yeah. Okay. You, you, you still looked like you were about to ask another, so.
Right. So as far uh, the question was, in terms of uh, creating a gold master, what other settings can inter could interfere? Um, the, and and you know, where, what if you wrote certain settings in, in your Kickstart and whatnot? We uh, we probably can't solve that perfectly. If you're uh, it, you shouldn't. Uh, the, re the, re the reality is, you probably shouldn't be doing that in Kickstart if you can help it. Unless you're, uh, you shouldn't be doing anything in Kickstart that isn't, uh, that you don't expect to be usable for all uh, all parts of your deployment. If it's and if it's system specific, it should be done either. If it's auto generated, it should be done with this mechanism. If it's not auto generated, it should probably be put in by configuration management software, not by. We we don't really need to solve that. That's a solved problem. So I, I would just say that our our statement is. Don't do that in Kickstart. It's going to it's going to bite you. I think I think people have figured that one out on their own though, for the most part. Mike again. Are we? The question is: Are we trying to get rid of RPM scriptlets entirely, or just the system specific stuff? The purpose of this specific talk is to get rid of the system specific uh, stuff. This is one step towards the uh, towards a future in which we can eliminate scriptless entirely because really they are a technology that was powerful and useful when they were invented and have introduced so many problems that they that we need to find a, a migration strategy away from them. If that wasn't, if that yes, if, if that wasn't clear, the answer is yes. We should get rid of scriptlets entirely. We do not need to do that as a single action, but we need to we need to migrate each. Again, Will's talk earlier in the week, and I, if you haven't seen it, I suggest you watch the recording once it's available. It talks a, a bit more about how to eliminate some of the others. Uh, uh, I he found six uh, specific t uh, things that covered 99% of all script use, uh, scriptlet usage, and at least five of them would be really easy not to do in scriptlets. Uh, the last one, the, the, the miscellaneous category, is a bit more tr effort. Do you think you could just say that you want to have that? I, don't, um, I actually don't think that one would be that hard. I think all of those are possible to pull out of the scriptlets relatively easily and uh, relatively in the couple, of, you know, the next few Fedora releases schedule, not like the next few uh, epochs. So Will is, Will is reminding me to make, make it clear that things like caches and catalogs are complicated and will probably require a great deal of thought, and I completely agree. That's part of why it's not part of this talk. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, I, I am firmly in the camp of RPM scriptlets need to, uh, need to go the way, uh, the way of, uh, I don't know, let's say Linux, uh, let's say Unix. Um, Sure, Etsy and it.d. We'll go with that. Are other di distributions trying to get rid of their uh, RPM scriptlets? I don't have at my fingertips that information. Um, Debian, at least, seems to be still pretty bent on maintaining debconf for whatever reason. Um, I can't speak to the other distributions. I I suspect that uh, the core OSs and the, uh, you know, the the other minimized container form uh, derived uh, distros are probably looking at this as well. Um, <laughs> as a counterpoint, uh, Gentoo's entire package management system is a collection of scripts. I am pretty sure I don't care. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't see. I don't really see what uh, if, what the other distributions are doing is less interesting than whether or not they are coming up with clever ways to do the things I'm suggesting. If we, if some of the, uh, you know, I will keep my eyes open, but uh, what little bit, uh, what little I've seen of this, um, like uh, Mandrake, for example, has basically just copied uh, this page. Uh, this page into their guidelines. 
Um, so I think they're, I think the other distributions are looking to us uh, to solve this, and we'll probably ad adopt it once we've proven that it doesn't break everything. Uh, which is pretty much par for the Fedora course, actually. Got three more minutes. So at the rate we're currently going, I've got time for one more question. Or else I can let you go to lunch three minutes early. Thank you all for participating.